Yep. <laughs> Oh, All right. Well, gone. good morning, everybody. Um, please mute yourself if you're uh, if you're not talking. Um, welcome to the Equip meeting. Uh, I am Gene Ransom. I'm the CEO of MedKai, and I chair the Equip committee. Um, we noticed on the list we have a lot of new people on here, so I just wanted to point out a couple of things before I turn it over to Jessica. And this is going to be a really good meeting. We're going to have a lot of updates, a lot of information about um, both. Uh, the current year and some information on how the last year ended up and everything else. Um, but the first thing I wanted to do, because we do have a lot of new people, is point out that we record all of these meetings. And we actually, if you go to um, medkai.org slash equip meetings materials, you can see literally every meeting back to 2020 has been recorded. One of the other nice things is when we do specific bundles, you'll notice, and these are the slide decks for each one as well. You should be seeing this on my screen right now. Uh, we also put uh, like ophthalmology focus or urology focus. So if you are um, if you are bringing on new people or you have a, a new bundle you're doing and you want your clinicians to understand it, um, even though they're a little old and they might talk about Prometheus and we switch the paces, um, they're a pretty good good explanation of the program and a pretty good uh, gives gives the docs an idea of what's going on. The other thing, and hopefully I can switch my screen here without too much trouble, uh, Olivia and Crystal from CRISP, and Olivia works with MedKai, uh, did a really good 10-minute overview video, which is really useful to show your clinicians uh, and others if they just want to understand it or someone who's new to it. Um, so I wanted to, to, to point all that out to everybody, and I'll let Jessica start to share her screen as I finish my introductory comments. <laughs> the other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, there are two ways that we're notifying you about these meetings. You should get an Outlook invite from MedKai, uh, and that, I think, comes from Oli you, Olivia, right? Olivia, that comes from Olivia. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, you should get an email from Chris. If you're getting this in some other way or someone's forwarding it to us, please let us know. Uh, we This is a very open advisory committee. We want everybody on it. We want people uh, to feel like they're able to participate. Uh, so we just let Olivia know or let me know or let Jessica know, or you can let Crystal at Chris know, and we'll get it straight eventually and go from there. Um, we have these meetings for those who aren't used to it, uh, typically the third Friday of the month, uh, and we do it every other month, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the the reason I'm not sure is because we often have to have extra meetings and that it feels like we're meeting a lot more, which we have been lately because we've been so busy. So uh, like I said, uh, cadence-wise, we've just finished uh, enrollment, which happens uh, August 30th. CMS is now doing vetting. Uh, then we will be dealing with signing participation agreements. Uh, the next big phase for us will be beginning to look at new bundles. So I'm sure Jessica's going to talk about that when she does her presentation and other things, but we have a lot of good stuff going on today. And I will turn it over to Jessica from CRISP to uh, take it over and get rolling for the Equip subgroup meeting for September of 2024. Jessica, it is all yours. Thanks, Jean. Um, and you're absolutely right. We have a lot going on. We're going to touch on essentially every single performance here because we're sort of closing one. Um, you know, in the middle of enrolling for another while we have one that's currently ongoing. So um, we'll touch all of these, we'll talk about resources, try to kind of um, give you an idea of timelines, what's going on in parallel, um, or what things need to be done sequentially as we move to next steps within each of these performance years. Um, so as you all are aware, those who were in performance year two, um, the results for all four quarters was released, um, I think, the second week in July, maybe. And um, we wanted to start with giving a little bit of overview of some very high level results. Um, our plan is in the November meeting to come back and give a little bit more detail once everything's been able to be digested and these numbers um, are finalized. So let's talk about PY2. Um, PY2 had 64 different entities participating and about 2,700 uh, care partners. Um, really um, very high representation for many different specialties. And then of course, as we saw with year one, there was a wide range in entity size. So you have some that are single practitioners that are participating. And then the largest entity in PY2 was just shy of a thousand care partners. Um, most of the care partners, or probably about 60% of the entities, did were what were considered um, 
multi-specialty, they were participating in more than one, um, whereas other strategies were to participate in just one specialty or one episode. You'll see this chart here. It's a little bit of a breakdown of the participation over the years. Um, I do want to note the ones that have the little asterisk next to it. These were brand new specialty categories that were added for PY2. Um, we saw the biggest jump in total episodes from year one to year two. So we added allergy, dermatology, um, a bunch of emergency care episodes, ophthalmology, and neurology, um, while cardiology, GI, and orthopedics carried over from year one. So when we're looking at year one to year two, um, 25 new episodes were added. And as I mentioned, those five distant specialties. Uh, of the 64 entities in PY2, 18 or 28% were brand new or participating for the first time. And I think that really is one of the goals as we look every year over year growth is to get net new people in. Um, and we've really appreciated the partnership with MedKai as we look at recruitment um, and advocating for adding new specialties and episodes. There were 50 episodes that participated, sorry, 50 entities that participated in year one. Um, 46 of them decided to continue to participate and were also in year two. And then um, not, you know, it makes sense. We added 25 new episodes. So we saw, you know, 100%, over 100% growth in total volume from year one to year two. Um, so you can see there were about just shy of 80,000 episodes in year two, um, about 46,000 of those episodes came from those that were in year one. And then of those 18 new entities, um, they made up about 32,000 uh, of those episodes. So really happy to see that growth um, and that growth both um, being distributed between those that were participating, looking to expand, um, maybe the care partners or the specialties that they are active in, as well as net new entities. Okay, these are very high top line numbers. So in year two, um, Equip saved about $38 million in the total cost of care. Uh, the, uh, the episodes uh, accounted for about 50 million in cost. So approximately we're looking at a 7% savings rate. So we do wanna note here that this 38 um, and the 7% is counted only for entities that exceed, exceeded the 3% minimum savings rate which is necessary for us to consider those savings statistically significant. Of those 64 entities, um, just about half or just shy of half um, did earn savings, but we did notice again, very high level that um, most of the smallest practices by volume um, did not see those savings or did not realize those savings uh, that very much aligns with the initiative of the practice transformation grant for next year. So based off of these savings, based off of MSR, um, the CMMI cap, as well as the quality um, adjustments, we expect to pay out about 19 million um, in incentive payments to the entities. So that's about 50% of the total earned savings. We do wanna note last year, that was about 60% we paid out. Um, new this year is that there is the added factor of an offset of disc savings for PY1. So we would expect to pay out just a slightly smaller amount for those that had disc savings in year one, saw savings in year two, and needed to offset that. This is a busy chart, um, and I'm sure people will digest this when we send out, but essentially we have a breakdown here of the different episodes um, by specialty type and by name. Um, I'll make some commentary on it and leave this up since I'm sure people are interested in the numbers, but do want to note that this chart and some of the other numbers that we're showing um, reflect everything. So that 19 million or sorry, that 38 million were just those entities that met MSR. Um, this is inclusive of everything at an entity level. So the savings may be lower here when it comes to percentage. Um, you'll note that orthopedics and cardiology, which were PY1 episodes, um, represent the largest share by baseline spend, um, and both of them did have a positive savings. Yeah. Looking at this chart, you can see that most specialties actually did include both, you know, high-performing and low-performing um, episodes or episodes that saw, saw savings and um, some that saw dis-savings. Um, there's some that were all positive. I think ophthalmology is probably the only one for that, but... Um, 
again, some information that we will dig into more as we look at some of the differences when we drill down into episode type. Um, kind of just com I just commented on to this, but of the new specialties, ophthalmology, of those new five specialties, ophthalmology was the only one that showed um, positive savings in a roll-up. So that means allergy, dermatology, emergency care, and urology, um, again, at a roll-up did have negative savings. But if you look at them, um, you'll see some differences in overall performance as we drill into that episode type. This was some of the commentary I just made. Um, so next steps. So this was very high level slides. Again, just some generalizations as we looked at overall savings and um, uh, some specialty grouping, but we do plan or HSC or C and Chris will plan to do some initial analysis and present it at the November subgroup. Um, we'll share much more detail and some additional trends that we may um, want to bring to everyone's attention. Um, and just a little bit of a note that currently the numbers you're seeing in EAP are considered preliminary. Um, there is some finalization steps that need to happen prior to payment, um, prior to us like officially announcing these. But essentially, HSCRC with every performance year conducts a post-episode monitoring analysis. Um, this is to just ensure that practices have not changed um, and are in line with sort of the normal expected uh, claim submission timeline. Essentially, no one's gaming the system. Um, we don't anticipate that finding anything, but of course, doing due diligence there. And then um, we require, uh, or as part of the uh, policy, there is a cap for the payout. So entities are capped um, from 25% of the Part B payments for their care partners in that entity. Um, we do rely on CMS to verify that. You will notice when you look in the reconciliation tab, um, Today, there is an estimate, so that was based off of the claims data that we currently have, um, but we are working with CMS to verify that. Um, we do expect it to change slightly, just like we saw last year, um, but wanted to give people the, the most information we have now. And of course, once everything is finalized, we will let people know it will be updated in the portal um, and uh, we'll communicate that appropriately. So Jessica, there is a question in the chat and it was, is there any participation in addiction medicine? Um, I think the answer to that is, is that really probably the only bundles that addiction medicine might consider doing would be the two behavioral health bundles, I would assume, which I think are depression and anxiety. I don't know that we have anything that fits really well. So if there's an interest in adding bundles, it's a good time to ask that question because we can certainly look and see if there's some bundles that would make sense for that specialty. So having looked through the list over the last few years, I have not seen a lot of addiction medicine in there are some who are in for various reasons or part of a larger group, but I have not seen that as a targeted episode or targeted area to answer that question. I don't know if you want to add anything, but. No, um, and certainly for PY2, we didn't even have the behavioral health episodes available. So um, you won't see it here, but Jean summarized that well. Um, we're certainly happy to talk to anyone who wants to explore that. We would also want to do, have some um, consideration on some of the um, suppression that CMS does with certain types of claims. Um, it may affect whether we could do a complete episode, but certainly want to continue that conversation. And we will talk about new episode development for PY. And Erica, I saw Erica just responded that she's just applied. And that, that makes sense logically. So we'd love, that's great. And if you have ideas for other episodes we can add, we would love to talk to you about if you had other ideas or suggestions. Great. Yeah, appreciate the growth. Okay, looking forward also, um, one of the things is people say, what next? You know, Jean mentioned there's a lot of new people. So we do have these every other month subgroups. Um, a lot of it is communicating administrative updates, you know, focus a little bit on the policy side, um, but we do are planning to host two additional learning collaboratives. One, which will be in October, which will be essentially a free for all Q and A about everything EQIP. Um, it will be on the 25th of October. We will send that registration link out with these materials after this meeting. Um, but we are asking for people to submit their questions by um, October 4th, um, I think that's in two weeks. Um, that will help us sort of group questions, make sure we have all the information that's needed there. Um, and again, this is really intended for people to ask what they like, ask any question. Um, and we will translate that obviously into a recording and slides that were posted, but plan to create an FAQ that lives on both the MedKai and the EQIP website as well. 
um, knowing that there's people with a variety of experience, a variety of years that they've participated in the program. Um, and this program has grown immensely. So it's a great time for us to sort of pause and just let it all out there and answer some questions. Um, additionally, there is, we're gonna focus on a reporting webinar. So we've done this, um, I think twice before, but again, with some brand new people, and we've also had updates in the portal. We plan to do a webinar of the reports that are available. Um, date TBD, we're trying to figure out between this October and the November one where that is assigned. So we'll look at our calendars and we'll send out that information as well. Um, and as with everything, if you can't make it, it will be reported. Okay, that's all I have for PY2 results. Now, those that did get um, show positive savings are saying, but this is great. When do I get my money? So we'll talk through that and we'll talk through a little bit about the steps that we have to do in the due diligence. So I'm not going to go over this, but as you know, essentially the difference between, you know, when we see that 38 million in savings of the state and when we get down to when, how much is written for the checks, it goes through a variety of different steps. We look at the tiers that you have for shared savings. We apply that, that quality score. And then number four here is important because that's that incentive payment cap. And I just mentioned that's a little bit of what we're working through right now in order to know the finalized numbers. So as a reminder, um, we can pay um, entities because we have this care partner arrangement and because UMS serves as the CRP for the state. We're very appreciative of all the administrative work that they do because it is quite cumbersome since we have you know, thousands and thousands of care partners. Um, so essentially what that means is we're doing a little bit of contract due diligence and auditing before we can send checks. And essentially that all comes down to the payment remission and the W-9 and the contracts. So the way that this flows is, as you all are aware, at the point of application during the enrollment period, um, each entity submits a singular place that they want the check to be sent to if earned. Um, that is ultimately what is put in the individual care partner arrangements that everyone signs. Um, and then uh, we set up, or really um sets up each entity as a unique vendor. We get a W-9, and in theory, the money should flow very, very smoothly. But what we've noticed, and you know, again, we expect this because there's about a two-year difference between when you enroll to when you know incentive payments are actually paid, um, things may change. So there are times, and we have noticed maybe about half of that 31 do have some differences in their W-9s and what their contracts state. Um, and essentially we need to work through that process. Um, there's a couple of different ones. One could be very simple as it's just named slightly different or there's a sweet number in one and not in the other. And that can be solved by essentially a new W-9 being submitted that accurately um, matches the contract. And it's pretty easy. We can set everyone up that way. Other times, there may be a good reason, you know, you may have moved or um, at the time you weren't aware that it was, should be, you know, a business address versus a physical address or things like that. Um, and you want that payment, that W-9 to really be where the check is being sent. And we do have an amendment process for that to happen. Do you want to note that every care partner in your entity must sign that amendment um, again, it's a due diligence. It's in order to make sure that we are in compliance from a contracting standpoint. Um, we will reach out to you guys if that is the case. Um, and and, and so and are we, just for clarification, are we going to have folks sign uh, the agreement if they've signed it before, or are we just having the new people sign it? So this is for PY2. Um, okay. And this is only for those that want essentially their checks to be sent to a different location oh, 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 okay. gotcha. um, than what was in the contract that they signed in like, uh, what would that be, 2023? That's mm -hmm. the time frame for 2022, but the fall of 2022. I, um, I, so I was actually asking about the care partner agreements because last year we had to get everybody to sign a new one, remember? And we will, mm -hmm. to, we, we will touch on that. Are we going to have to do that again? Yes, everyone will have to sign a new one. Um. Okay, so what that means is that we will be reaching out to the groups. If there's an easy fix, great, we can make that. And if we need to send amendments, we will send them out within the next couple of weeks and ask for them due in sort of, you know, probably early, mid-October. Um, and eventually we're all working towards the checks going out in Q4 of this year. Um, last year, we sent them out, I think, by regular mail. We will be sending them out, or UMS really will be sending them out via FedEx. 
um, to allow for tracking and everything like that. Um, however, we have noticed that some groups have PO boxes. In that case, they will have to be sent via paper check. Um, we will, of course, notify everyone when checks are mailed and be in close contact so you can be aware of the timeline and know when to expect it. Um, we'll hear a lot of this today, but essentially, if you don't hear from us, that's a good thing. Um, no news is good news. We will essentially, each of these entities have to be considered individually with their scenario, um, and we will reach out and direct you essentially what are your next steps. Okay, that was all PY2 results, PY2 incentive payments. And we're gonna skip to PY4. Uh, so PY4, as you all know, we just ended the enrollment period in August 30th, so just a couple of weeks ago. Um, where do we stand? So there are just shy of 5,000 care partners that were submitted for CMS vetting. We're seeing great representation across all specialties. Um, and we're seeing, we saw a growth in the total number of EQIP entities participating. Um, 152. I think last year we were closer to like 130 for PY3. Um, again, all of these numbers and everything during this enrollment cycle is very preliminary. We need to wait on CMS vetting, contracting, and everything like that. So you may see some of these numbers change. That's to be expected. So what's going to happen over the next couple months for people? Um, we have a fair amount of enrollment activities. And again, everything is, we will contact you if this applies to you. So deduplication across care partners, um, we know this, care partners can only exist in one entity. Um, CRISP has already actually completed this process and reached out to entities impacted, and they have decided essentially where that uh, care partner should live. Um, all of that is now cleared up. So again, that's great news. We're past that step. Um, in parallel to all this, CMS is doing some vetting. Um, we're estimating that to be given back in late October. Um, it sort of, sort of depends, so this may be closer to November. Again, we'll let you know if that timeline changes, but essentially we will get those that update from CMS and let you know if any care partners are not considered eligible for the program. Um, most of this sort of comes in two different phases. So we'll get those that did not pass the PICOS screening, and then we'll also get the program integrity and law enforcement screening. screening. Um, overall, historically for over the last, three years now, this has impacted a very low percentage, but it, it is a few that drop off here and there. And again, we will reach out to you if you, one of your care partners um, are impacted by the vetting results. The other thing that is done is there's a couple auditing and eligibility criteria. The biggest one that we see the most changes on care partner lists is the claim threshold. So what this is, it is a requirement for at least 75% of the NPIs on your list or of your care partners need to appear in the baseline data. And again, that's 2019. So we do anticipate that, again, that's not everyone. You may have had new care partners that have joined. Um, and we do allow for 25% of your list to, again, not be on um, in baseline. Those that don't meet that threshold essentially will be asked to edit their care partner list and um, remove people, things like that, in order to meet that threshold. So again, if your entity isn't contacted, your threshold is met, there is not an issue. But we'll go back and forth with that. Once every iteration of this auditing, as there are changes to the care partner list, we need to go back and verify eligibility. So essentially, once this is all done, we will look to ensure things like the volume threshold has still been met, um, there may be times we have to go back and say, oh, you know, someone dropped from CMS vetting and now you don't meet the, C the 75%. So there's little tweaks and changes every time and we rerun all of these um, eligibilities and we'll let you know how that impacts you. Again, there are times based off of people dropping off your list that you no longer meet, let's say the 11 volume threshold for a specific episode. We may say, hey, look, we dropped that episode. Your other episodes have continued as normal. Again, each entity is a little case by case based off of the list and how each of these policies impact them. So the big one, um, as Jean just asked, is care partner arrangements. So for PY4 and likely moving forward, we will require care partners to sign, all care partners to sign a new arrangement every year. Um, this year, the major change had to do with the grouper language. So there's differences in the contracts for the prior years 
that noted the Prometheus grouper, whereas this year we kept paces. One of the things we've also noticed year over year, as we're getting to the point to paying out um, uh, checks, names of entities change, addresses of entity change, and it's very difficult to manage it from a auditing standpoint. Um, for example, if we do allow rollovers, you could have a portion of your population have one address or one entity name because they signed in year two and a different portion of your group, again, that has different information because they signed in year three. So definitely for year four, we are looking at everyone signing a new care partner arrangement and um, looking at what that looks like forward, um, leaning towards every year, this will be part of the policy to ensure that we have no issues with compliance and payments. During this process, we are trying to get a little bit ahead of the game um, and um, confirm that W9 address is correct for the um, correct uh, and matches the payment remission. So we're reaching out to entities to um, verify that. When contracts go out, we do rely on the PUCs for each entity. So we send out uh, ums and uh, send out a combination of the care partner arrangements to the lead care partner and the administrative proxies for each of the entities. So again, we really rely on you guys to disseminate that. All the contracts are pre-filled, they're standardized, there's no um, changes that are allowed. Um, and one of the big things that we, I wanna emphasize this year is we really need the full contract back. There are times that people submit just the signature page, um, but a lot of the meat of the information that the individual is attesting to or saying that I will participate exists in those other sheets. So it's really important that we get those back. Um, the email is going to come from UMS, but UMS and Chris works very closely together to hopefully streamline this communication. Um, and again, we really rely on the lead care partners and admin proxies to essentially disseminate that information and um, uh, give it back or get the assigned care partners back to UMS in order to ensure everyone is compliant and ready to participate um, next year. And as mentioned, it is a requirement. No signed amendment means that they will not be participating for next year. Or sorry, no signed contract means they will not be participating for next year. Okay. The other thing is just want to note about the practice transformation grant. Um, you all aware people um, submitted, we had, I think about 50, um, probably a little bit wrong in that number, um, applicants that were done during the enrollment period. We currently right now are in this evaluation process. So we are working through entities that may have submitted but not been eligible, um, going through the open-ended responses and diving into additional process assessments to understand what is a specific needs um, and how we can allocate resources for them. A little bit about that timeline. So that's really in September and October where we're doing all that. We plan to communicate those um, entities that are awarded the grant um, in November of this year. And again, that would be effective January 2020, 2025. Okay. Jumping all around. So now we're moving to PY5, which is calendar year 2026. Um, and yes, it seems early, but we really do need to start thinking about that now. This is just sort of a high level, but really this time frame is to gauge people's interests. The early part of next calendar year is where the, the real meat needs to be done. And then we work into spring being able to recruit those, recruit new, new specialties or advocate for new um, uh, episodes that have been added. And then it leads to that July 1 uh, portal opening for PY5. So we do plan, and one of the great things that we looked at when we were analyzing the need to change to a grouper is the giant catalog that PACES has. So we really want to leverage that when we're looking for future performance years. Some of their episodes are in different phases of development. So there may be more work needed for some or less for others. We certainly can distribute those um, to get people's ideas of if there's something that they say, yes, we absolutely want to do this episode. Um, and for those that have not reached out to us or are interested in more information, please email Chris, we will get you that. And again, try to work through that process. Um, we are very much committed to working really with all interested stakeholders. One of the big lessons learned this year is that we will be communicating and looking at 
uh, more uh, uh, more strict guidelines and timelines. Um, it really does bleed into being able to get information in the um, enrollment period and in uh, enrollment cycle. Um, so we'll look at that. We haven't figured out exact dates. We'll communicate that next. But right now, interest. That's what we're looking for. People are interested in it. We can at least start conversations, um, prioritize things, and um, hopefully move forward into um, having sort of a short list of what we expect to add. Um, and also, we'll bring it back to this group. And really, this is everything that has been added has come from you all. So we want people, those with interest to be added um, and the feedback is very helpful as we look at adding and prioritizing. Gene, you have something to say? Yeah, I was just gonna say two things. One is um, when we talk about adding, it's not just for specialties that aren't included, which we really want, obviously. And I think we have some holes that we really need to talk about. Like we, we keep talking about nephrology, but we never get it done. We need to get that one done. And there's some others like that that we need to fill. But the other thing too, where a lot of people in this call can be very helpful and I saw there was an email between me and Dr. Weinstein that I just sent to Jessica, is looking and seeing it established uh, areas like GI where Dr. Weinstein and I were communicating and seeing if there's opportunities there and possibly adding additional episodes in places where we have them. So uh, the earlier you can reach out and work with us, the better. And we really need clinical help. Uh, we're going to need a physician to help us with, with, with making sure that we uh, get them on board right. Uh, and just to understand the timeline, we have to have all this done done by early spring, late winter. Um, so we're talking like March, April, so we can get it through clearance and get it approved for the following year. So uh, really start thinking about it now. And, and, and it's really a great way to create new opportunity and excitement and more people uh, joining in the future year. So um, and feel free to reach out to me or Olivia or Crystal or Jessica if you have ideas. Yeah, thanks, Jean, and you're absolutely right. We're looking to expand additional or specialties that we currently touch, um, as well as at new ones. So, okay. So dates coming up, and we'll send this out when we send out the materials. Um, but for PY three, th there are some upcoming data releases. So at the end of this month, on Friday the twenty seventh, the first quarter for PY one will become available. Um, again, we're planning to do a webinar about the reporting suite for those that may be seeing um, performance data for the first time. And then um, Q2 data working around the Thanksgiving holiday is um, tentatively scheduled to be released on Friday, uh, December 6th. Um, and that would give you half the year's worth of data. Um, we sometimes, for some of our policies, use the first six months when we look at continued eligibility. So that will be factored in. Again, we'll communicate that to you if it impacts you. Um, as mentioned, we have this FAQ coming up um, on the 25th. Please send all questions so that we can address them appropriately. Um, and then we're planning to do this, this webinar um, specifically on the reporting suite, trying to figure out dates there, but we'll let you guys know. And then our next subgroup is scheduled for November 15th. Um, we know that on the agenda, we'll continue to talk about PY5 development, send updates about what everyone should expect as we move towards the end of this um, Sort of contracting and enrollment period, as well as bring back some additional um, commentary and analysis on PYT results. And then finally, do want to point out, and thank you, Jean, for also mentioning at the beginning, there's a lot of resources. Sometimes it can be overwhelming, um, but we do want to point out that CRISP also has a learning system. Um, we do archive the meetings um, that MedKai uh, uh, records. Um, and then as we talk about sort of new things this year, there is also a subpage specifically for the practice transformation grant and a subpage specifically for PACES to have more information for you all. Um, and we plan to leverage the FAQ to see if there's additional things we need to build out from our learning system as we look at gaps in knowledge and, and holes or frequently asked questions. And then finally, um, as Jean mentioned, we're all here to assist. Um, I think the equip inbox we try to just say is the best way to just send one email, we'll get it to the right place. But again, feel free to reach out to us individually um, and we will triage and send it where it needs to. Um, I think that's all of the, the um, oh, there's a great question in the chat um, about the lumbar episodes. So as we shared with our entities in the middle of enrollment, um, there was still some work going on with the clinical definition related to the lumbar episodes. So in the portal, it allowed those to participate, but it didn't have specific volume and numbers. 
Um, we actually just did finalize that and you should be hearing, everyone who did enroll in the lumbar episodes will be getting specific information about their volume and their total cost and will have a, um, a couple of days, maybe a week, um, to say, do they want to continue with enrollment or do they want to drop those episodes? Um, so we appreciate everyone's patience on that. Um, like I said, we wanted to ensure that the data that we're sending or the information communicated is accurate and work through to make sure it's also clinically sound. Um, you should be receiving that shortly. Um, am I seeing anything else? There's a question about the playbook. So the playbook is updated. Um, it does have all of F episodes except for the lumbar. We just need to add those again. We just recently got that information. So it is linked on our website. It has, I think there was something about pulmonary episodes. Everything is in there except for lumbar. It will be updated again now that we have the lumbar episodes in there. Um, and just as a note, the, the playbook does include slides that have um, the trigger codes and an overview of the pre-trigger period and the post-trigger period, but linked in that um, playbook, it does allow for the Excel download of the full um, of the full codes and everything like that. So sometimes we're asking where that lives. It's all embedded within the playbook. Um, you know, please reference that if you're seeing something that's not linked. You know, please let us know. We'll update it. Um, it could just be you know a hyperlink that went on or something like that. But everything is updated except for lumbar at this time. Now we got hold on. one more question. Yeah, oh. Two more. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you. No, it's okay. They're they're adding more than I can see. Um, is there any update from the HSC or Sucrose about the disc savings policy continuation from PY3 to PY4 due to the changes in grippers from Prometheus to paces between performance year? Is there still a plan to pause the disc savings policy for one year? Um I think if I'm understanding this correctly, there is some consideration on addressing on a case-by-case -case basis, those entities that saw savings in Prometheus and did not see savings in PACES. Um, we probably would want, would make an exception and would want to dig deeper into understanding, you know, again, why someone was successful. Um, why someone was um, successful under one grouper and not successful under the other. Um, and keep in mind, I believe that would be applicable for PY7, <laughs> um, if we get these right, because um, PY4 would be with, um, oh no, sorry, PY3 is in PACES, is in Prometheus, PY4 is in PACES, and then that would impact, yes, PY7. Um, so we are talking a little time off, but, or time from now, but certainly we'll look at that. Um, that being said, we believe those that saw just savings under both grouper, likely the policy would be applied as is, um, but really do want to work and look at the impact of the grouper change year over year, especially those that were disadvantaged from that change, um, having been successful and then no longer with PACES. And Victoria, let me know if I answered that question correctly, if I'm understanding that. Um, and then there is a question about um, regarding the episode for dermatology. Um, I'd say reach out to the EQIP inbox. Um, we can get more information if you're looking to essentially dive into the clinical episode that's currently available or add new episodes. Happy to work through that process with you and connect you to um, the PACES experts and um, see what's needed. And, and Dr. Richards, if you want, you can just text me. Um, Olivia and I started doing a little work to see what was kind of partially built for dermatology and paces. Uh, one other point um, that I wanted to point out with regards to developing new episodes, um, and in fact, I'll send you what I've got so you can get jump started on that, Dr. Richard. But um, one other point I wanted to make is, is that we do have some episodes where some work has been done by paces. Those are going to be a lot easier for us to get up and running. Whereas if we're building something totally from scratch, it is really imperative you get a hold of us right away because there's a lot of work having been involved in a couple of those over the course of the last four years or so that happens that just just takes a lot longer to deal with. Uh, whereas if a lot of if some of that baseline work's been done ahead of time, it's easier for us to get there. I think that's all the questions I'm seeing in the chat. Um, I'm actually surprised we got through everything. Um, so quickly, I thought there'd be more. Um, we will obviously send out information. Please keep an eye on the learning system on MedKite's website. We'll push out communication there. 
Um, do we, we want to ask if anybody from the HSCRC wanted to say anything or just to give them a shot? Krista or Will, anything? Oh, thanks. I don't have anything to add. Thanks, Gene. All right. I just feel like we're finishing in record time, which is <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we didn't confuse everyone with all the PYs and CY years um, <laughs> we'll send this out um, like I said we know there's a lot going on right now and it, as it applies I think the biggest takeaway is you will hear from us <laughs> if you're impacted by any of this so um, sometimes well, no news is good news on it, that it, right and the second thing is too is that we are available that that the email is uh, one place if you're not sure but it's not a big deal to reach out directly to me or Jessica or probably even more efficiently Olivia on my team Olivia Simon and Crystal on Jessica's team um and we're happy to help you we we really the reason this program has been so successful is because it's really been a public private partnership with a lot of different parties and we've all been working together so uh don't don't feel shy about reaching out if you have a problem all right Victoria I guess they see a hand. Hi, I just wanted to get some clarification on that third question. I think I asked about the savings policy. So are you saying, because you said you mentioned like PY7, I was just, because like with the change in the groupers for the upcoming performance year, I didn't know like how the this savings would be applied because I don't, I, I guess I was confused when you said PY7 at the end about how like that, like that, the, the savings policy would apply all the way in calendar 2028. Yeah, and I might have gotten the calendar years incorrect too, trying to do that quickly. Um, essentially, as you know, there is a delay in the finalization of um, performance and just savings is not ever um, uh, implied on half of a year. We are waiting for like the finalizations of numbers. So PY4 numbers, we would not see until, I'm getting this right, um, until the middle of PY5. So I apologize, that may impact PY6 eligibility. Um, but essentially, I think the takeaway there is those that were did see savings in Prometheus that did it in PACES, we're going to look at that and we're going to see if an exception applies, likely it would. Um, but again, not trying to like jump to conclusions. We do definitely want to see how it plays out. Um, and again, I apologize if I meant if I meant six instead of seven, but um, I know there's a delay and lag in when we get the final numbers to how it applies to the upcoming year. And one other thing, so Jessica, at some point in time this year, you the CRISP slash HSCRC will be making a determination on what is a new entity and what isn't too. So that might calm down some questions as some of the entities, if they are less than 40% membership of the prior year, might be considered a new entity under the policy as it's currently written. So one of the things that might make sense for some of you who are concerned is to send an email and have a specific meeting and discussion and see where you stand. Go ahead, Victoria. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I was just... um. I was just trying to understand, like, especially with the, like, new entities that Jean just mentioned. So in the case that, like, let's say an entity generated this savings under PACES, but savings under Prometheus, but because there's been such an expansion of the episodes, is that what you were alluding to with the case-by-case -case basis? Would it be based on just the same episodes that they were enrolled in under one group or versus the other in the event that they might have added new episodes under pieces so currently we are not slice and dicing the episodes as far as like you did this this year and this this year um we're trying to essentially consider the circumstances that they were under you know for example this year we took into effect in into impact the um delay in data delivery due to the um, change healthcare uh, security issue um so it would essentially be a policy that's applied across the board i think the focus would be again in just those groups that saw dis sorry, sorry savings for PY4 and now see dis savings in PY. Sorry, I'm gonna get these numbers. So dis savings in PY3 and saw no, savings in PY3 and dis savings in PY4. Um, we're happy to respond and write this out because I apologize. All the PYs are getting a little difference and change in there. Layered on top of that, with throughout all of the years, and I think we shared this at our last subgroup. As Jean mentioned, there is policy impacted as far as what defines a continuous entity, a new entity, and a succession entity. So that is applied uh, you know, on this 
independent of the GERPA change. Um, however, if you are in the situation where your continued eligibility is dependent on both PY3 and PY4, we will look at if you are no longer successful under PACES, um, but you were successful under Prometheus. And sorry if I <laughs> added more confusion with all of my uh, PYs getting a little mixed up. Okay, that's helpful. Also, just like I know that this was mentioned at the July meeting too, but in terms of like successor entities, just for like tracking for stakeholders in terms of like equip ID number changes and or names, because I know some of um, our member orgs entities had changed names and IDs. Will this occur during the process of when you're finalizing the care partner rosters again for the PY4? Part, like for PY4 participation, is that when that kind of like primary versus successor entity and then the equip ID slash name changes are going to occur? Yes. So okay. yes, we because everything is dependent on your final MPI list because we look at the composition of the lists year over year. Um, in the case where you have just changed so much that you are a new entity, um, we notify you, but you don't have to do anything. So for example, your entity number you know 50, you change everything so much that you have a, essentially a whole different group of NPIs. We'll just let you know, hey, you're, no, we're discontinuing number 50. You've been assigned a new entity number and name. Um, and we do all that for you. If you are identified as a succession entity, again, it's more informational. There's nothing that you need to do, but we will let you know that you are a succession entity to this primary entity. Um, but yes, it absolutely is being done. Um, after all of the care partner lists have been changed, we don't want to do anything prematurely, knowing that it could slightly, um, um, the outcome of that could slightly change dependent on who's added, um, or really who's dropped from care partner lists. Okay, thank you so much. And Melanie, I see your hand. Yeah, um, so I just, Jean, is it okay if I just do a quick um, no, of course. Promo okay. for the so so um most of you know me. I'm Melanie Cavalier. I'm the chief of innovative care delivery at the Maryland Healthcare Commission. And I just want to remind everyone that the Maryland Healthcare Commission has a grant with MedCI for a practice transformation program that's open to any primary care or specialists. There um there's no real criteria to get in other than you know they need to have a licensed clinician. It could be a DO, an NP. Um, you know, um, obviously, or MDs. So we've worked with all kinds of specialists. We've graduated 72 practices from the program so far, and we do have open slots. So if you're interested, please reach out to Jean and I. It's really meant to help prepare practices for um, value-based care programs like this or the MBPCP. Um, the only programs that we don't, I mean, the only practices we don't take are ones that are currently in MBPCP. And I know there's another practice um, transformation program associated with Equip that has kind of rules around it, but ours is open. And um, you know we're happy to take any practices that are interested or you think could use some additional assistance to be successful in these value-based care programs. So thank you for the time this morning, Jane. So, and just to clarify on the difference, so the Equip uh, grant, it, 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 we need to give it a different name because it's confusing. The equip grant is actually totally different and it's closed. So if you haven't applied, you're too late. The equip grant is really to help you be successful once you're already in the program. Um, and that's uh, for folks who either did not have savings, they were dissaved in their first year or who are brand new to the program to help them be successful in the program. And it's very specific to equip. The program that Melanie's talking about is really like an it's a practice assessment and an value in a, in a value based care one on one readiness for value based care. Uh, it really gets you ready to participate and be successful in one of these programs. So they're totally different programs. And for any of you who know practices who are not doing this yet but need help or uh, are missing key pieces. Uh, it's really a great way to get in. So um, I just second that. And Melanie, we'll we'll get some information. I'll have Olivia send it out to everybody so they can share it. I, most people on this call obviously are already in, but they might know other practices that could use the help or, or want to take that next step. Right, right. Thanks, Jean. And hey, Victoria, is that another question or is that an old hand? Yes, it's another question. Sorry. Um, you don't have I to apologize. It's totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had a question just to follow up about the, like, Chris notifying entities are eligible.
for the lumbar enrollment groups. Is that something that would just be updated if an entity was interested in? Sorry, is that something that the um that Chris would just notify like the entities, lead care partners, and admin proxies, and they will be updated by like they would send the update via email, or would they have to go back and eat? To make no, that. so EAP is closed. Any changes right. um, need to be done on the back end. So for participants um, at this point, yeah, they're, they're, you actually cannot make any changes in the portal. Um, so our plan is, as we mentioned, anyone who was interested in lumbar episodes already should have indicated that they would like to participate. Those entities that have done that, we will be reaching out to them and letting them know, you know, you want to participate, but here's the actual numbers. Um, and send you like volume, um, we'll send you an MPI breakdown and let you all make that decision if you still want to participate or based off of that information that you now have, you would like to drop from an episode. Um, we're not planning to send it to everyone because those that were interested or you know did have um, groups um, that you know do that specialty or do those procedures um, should have already indicated that they would like to participate for next performance year. Okay. And there's a turnaround for that similar to a duplicate MPIs. You're giving them a week? About a week, yeah. I mean, um, we'll we'll try. Essentially, if you guys can give us the information as soon as you can, but obviously we know we want you guys to be able to digest it. Um, mm -hmm. As we look at sort of all these changes, essentially all of the auditing that needs to happen is dependent on sort of prior changes. So just we like to kind of keep that in mind. Um, you know, the next step can't be taken until we first clean up you know, one other one. So yes, we will be sending that. Our hope is to send it today, if not on Monday, um, since we just got the information. Um, but yes, hoping to get it in your all's hands very, very soon so you're able to digest that. Okay. And my other question was just about um, that my former question about the savings policy. Is that something that will be sent like to the distribution list for the subgroup about what you were talking about for people yeah, who... So Okay. My point is, I'll just add a slide into this and we'll send it out to everyone. It'll also be posted, obviously, on all the webs, on all the um, MedKai and um, Chris website. But I think that's probably the best so that it lives somewhere and not just in an email. Um, but we'll add a slide in this deck to ensure that it's documented. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions at all? All right, well, everybody have a wonderful weekend and enjoy the last day of summer. Thanks, everyone.